The Build Show Bill Boston series is sponsored by Alora Fiber Cement Siding, Mitsubishi Electric Train US, Roseburg, Shuko USA, and Warmboard. There's a lot of ways to start a project, right? I get a client, client comes to me and says, hey Steve, I wanna you know, work with you as an architect. Um, we have our dreams, we have our property, we have, um, you know, we, we think we know what we wanna build. So I, I say that loosely, we, I get a lot of clients that come to me and say, well, I know exactly what I wanna do. Um, we've been thinking about this for three or four years and we know exactly what we want to do. I tell them, <clears throat> you know exactly what you think you can do. Because the one thing you haven't explored are the things that you don't know about. Let's talk building size and performance metrics for a minute. I've been doing this 30 plus years. Yeah. That's just, uh, can't change that. But one of the things I've learned in 30 years is there's this thing, I label it as upward pressure. And upward pressure is, you know, the size of the house, clients. I have never met a client that probably doesn't want a bigger house. Size of the house, it matters, right? It, it matters in that there's the initial cost of the size of the house. There is the maintenance cost in the size of the house. There's the operating cost in the size of the house. Now, when you're building a house, a lot of people like to just focus on the cost to build the house, right? How much is that house per square foot? Well, how much does it cost to operate a year? How much does that house cost to maintain a year, right? These are other questions that need to be added to how much does that house cost per square foot? I hate that comment because it, it really doesn't solve for a lot of things, but we don't have a metric that really works any better, so we're forced to use that one. But there are a bunch of additional comments that, or questions that should be joining that in the conversation. When you're sitting there with your architect and your builder and you're discussing the size, well, all these other things like maintenance, durability, um, quality of air inside, how much you know ventilation do we have to provide based on the size of that house. Um, so all of these things come into play. The other thing that comes into play is what are the performance metrics of the house, right? How do we deal with that? Now, I have a lot of clients that come to me and just say, hey, Steve, I, you know, I'm thinking passive house or I'm thinking this or that. Well, there's a lot of labels out there, right? There's Energy Star, there's Pretty Good House, there's um, Lead, there's Passive House. Honestly, I'm not a labels guy. I take it as my clients come to me they come with a certain budget, they come with a certain dream, and it's my job as the professional to knit the budget, knit the dream with their dream house to get the best performance that we can out of that. Now, all along the way, it's my job as the professional to offer opportunities to where that performance can take a left turn or a right turn, right? We can use this insulation. We can maybe make the wall thicker. Um, we can improve our air tightness on here. We can look to companies that can enhance the air tightness. As far as air quality goes, we can do an enhanced filtration system to enhance the uh, air quality that we're providing via the ventilation system. So there's a lot of performance metrics. And, you know, I tell all of my clients when we sit down on day one that, yeah, let's Let's use this in a really general sense because we need to start that conversation somewhere. But I'm not one of those architects that likes to draw this fine line in the sand because I really think it's a moving target because as we go along, we're going to learn things. And one of the other things that I've learned, especially with a, a client like Scott and, and Jonathan, asking questions all the time and doing their own research well, we might find that there's a new product that's coming out that might be somewhat of a game changer in what we're doing and that the metrics maybe need to alter to support the effort of using that new product um, in lieu of using a different product. So the performance metrics are a good thing, but I would say hold on to them loosely. Now, I say that in the same tone as Scott and Jonathan came to me 
with this house and they said they wanted it to be a zero energy home, right? So zero energy is pretty much, I use a certain amount of energy to operate the house, maintain the house, et cetera, but I need to generate a certain amount of energy that offsets that cost and basically zeroes it out on the spreadsheet at the bottom of the spreadsheet, right? So I'm looking for that zero at the bottom line. Now, it's not really hard to do. I have a, dozens of homes where I have clients that have never seen an energy bill, right? So imagine that. You build your dream house on a property, you absolutely love it, and you get your first energy bill, and at the bottom it says $0.00. Who doesn't want an energy bill like that, right? And a lot of them are you know, retired couples um, moving in and, and downsizing and, and seeking that kind of dream home that is zero energy. I tell people it's the greatest retirement plan you can strive for is to move into a house that is virtually maintenance free, but also energy independent so that whatever happens in the world, it doesn't affect your house. That as long as the sun rises every day, well, then we get energy from the sun. We get some, uh, put a PV array on the house. We can charge our cars. I have one client that, yeah, he charges two cars for him and his wife. And he lives in the house, never has had an energy bill, takes care of heating, cooling, um, cooking, ventilation, everything. The air quality in the house is superb. And he's never had an energy bill. And, you know, kudos to him for his decision. I, again, tell people, man, that's the best retirement plan that's out there. So doing this video is to develop that kind of question book for you as a homeowner, you as a builder, um, to ask about the projects, ask of your architect, and, um, and or if you're the architect, these are the questions that you should be prepared to answer or inject into the project. Um, you know, we're all in it for the win, and uh, you know, to get there, we all have to do our part. So anyways, zero energy, I'm looking forward to it. We have a roof that is solely dedicated to becoming a PV platform to generate all of the power to take this project to zero. All right, so now that we know, at least set up the goalpost of what our performance metrics are, the next step is, is to knit those together with the desires of our clients with their home and, and their dreams of what they want this home to be. And right, so everybody wants a zero energy house, but you still want it to look good. You still want to have a beautiful kitchen. You still want to have a beautiful living room and you want all the aesthetics that come to it. Um, you know, one of my favorite words or lines is that a house should perform as good as it looks. So there's a lot of houses out there. There's a lot of very talented architects out there that absolutely make stunning projects. But when I dive into them, I'm kind of uh, saddened by the fact that maybe the performance isn't anywhere near what the aesthetics are. I'll give you a quick analogy. Imagine you go to a dealership, you're looking to buy that brand new Ferrari, and you look at it, things as sexy as hell, you walk around, mouth watering, dreams coming true, then you pop the hood and you find out it has a Volkswagen engine in it. Not that Volkswagen is a bad company, but it's certainly not a Ferrari motor, right? You'd be a little kind of saddened, a little disheartened that the performance isn't matching aesthetic metrics. Well, what we're trying to do here is make you aware of how do we ensure that the performance metrics are meeting the aesthetic metrics of the house so that we're giving you the complete package, right? When we, when we put a, a building on the ground, understand that it's probably not going to sit there for five or ten years. I mean, in New England, I've worked on projects. The oldest house was built in 1690. So I can't imagine the guy that was putting that house together in 1690 was thinking that there was going to be an architect in the year 2000 that was going to be renovating that house 310 years later, right? But the reality is, is that what we're building today, it's gonna to sit on the earth for a little bit of time. And in that little bit of time, it's gonna demand 
some loving, some tenderness and care. It's going to demand that the house be properly heated, cooled, all of that good stuff. And it's kind of our moral responsibility to ensure that the aesthetics and the performance metrics are on the same page, that we're not sacrificing one to achieve the other. So anyways, the way we get there is we, we have the performance metrics in mind. We have a client that has bought into the system. Now, as an architect, we got to dive into the details and we have to knit together what I call that sweet spot, right? Because there's a lot of materials out there. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat, if you will, for that old cliche. You know, there's not necessarily this insulation is better than that one or this product is way better than that one. I mean, I hear that all the time in conversations around the construction industry. But the reality is, is the one that works the best is the one that's installed properly with the right intention and the check to make sure that the goals of our intent have been met. So it's kind of this closed loop, right? That we select materials based on what we want to do. We detail them out. We work through those details. We then verify at the end, test whatever we need to do and assure that our initial intent has been met. And if it hasn't, then obviously we need to um, rework, work with the contractor, do whatever we need to do. But the outcome should be that our original tent, intent has been met. So we need to dive into the details. Of course, we're going to do that. We're going to show you, you know, all the questions that were asked in this project. And like all questions, there's the great answer. There's the modest answer. There's the okay answer. And then there's the answer that we probably don't want to do. And so we're going to run through that gamut of selection processes of when do we choose the great answer? When do we choose the more modest answer? Because you can't have all A plus decisions and solutions unless you're willing to pay an A plus price. And, you know, not everybody wants to build the A plus house. I mean, everybody wants to build it and not everybody wants to pay for it. So you're always challenged as an architect to find that sweet spot, right? Because that sweet spot is how does how do those decisions get made? How do they kind of knit together to make the process? Probably the best analogy that I've used with working with clients is to think of every project as a giant abacus, right? So all the knobs are on the left-hand side. Left-hand side is probably the least approved choice that we want to make. To the right side of the abacus is the greatest choice we could make or solution. Well, the reality is, is the sweet spot is not moving every knob to the right because for most clients that isn't really possible, nor is it even really desired. Um, but it's a, my job as the architect to move the knobs a certain distance and kind of knit that project together to, again, find that sweet spot in what we're doing. That's kind of the, the background of how do I work with homeowners and, and what are we striving for? What is our goal here on the project, right? So now the question that comes up is, well, how do we get there? And I hear it all the time. I, I get some clients that, hey, I've, I've worked with an architect for over a year on this project. We really can't get there. Or one of my favorites is I get this a lot. Um, and it's only because of the background that I have. I get clients that come to me and say, hey, Steve, you know, we designed this house down here in Tennessee, been working with an architect for over a year, but they have no clue on, you know, how to do the details and, and how to make this a passive house. And I really want to go there. And, you know, I, I tell them that I really can't help them at that stage because I'm a firm believer that when you design a project that there's a, a very, very large gap between the concept of application and the concept of integration, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, you get a lot of architects and homeowners and builders that want to design like we've designed houses for the last 50 or 100 years, whatever, put a, a time frame on it. But 
um, the reality is is that they design the house and then say, oh, well, let's talk about how we're going to enhance the insulation on the project. Let's talk about how we're going to enhance the air quality on this project. Well, that's like the ship's already out of port and you're trying to figure out how to put something on it. It's gone, right? Ship has sailed. All those cliches. We'll throw them all at you. But the reality is, is that you can't. You can't apply this stuff. Now, PV panels, yeah, you can build your average house and you can just take the back of the house and say, we'll load it up with PV panels. I'll make it zero energy and I'll be happy. Certainly a viable approach. Certainly an approach that I know people that have done that. Certainly not the approach that I would advocate. What I would advocate is that, you know, we talked about building metrics is, and, and such and getting that stuff out early. But when I have that understanding of that, as an architect, it's my responsibility and the builder, and we're very fortunate that we had the builder on board on this project early on, because getting their opinions on stuff gives us that full integration of decision-making process and the full integration of what questions to be asked, right? So I could come up with a great product, the homeowner can buy into it, but then the builder, we have to ask him, is that a product that we can get in the Northeast? Does that, is that sold up there? Is it something that we can get shipped across the country? Like, where are we going to source that product? Is it available in the U.S.? Just because we saw it up in Canada or over in Europe somewhere. Maybe we can't get that product. But we, we have to know what are those questions to ask and then when we ask those questions, we need to be able to take those solutions and we need to integrate them into the project, not apply them to the project. They need to be a part of the project. There's a lot of things that are easily done when we're designing the house for it. Now, a lot of people love to sit there and say, oh, that's a real expensive you know, option. Oh, that costs a lot of money to do that. The reality is, is a lot of these things surprisingly don't cost a whole lot more money. Yes, they might cost a little bit more money, but they don't cost a whole lot more money if they're part of the integrated plan. If they're part of the applied plan, hell yeah, they might cost a bundle of money because it's not easily installed. It's not part of the design. So that integrated set of details, the right questions to ask, all of this stuff, it's imperative to the success of the project. And that's what this video series is all about. One of the real reasons to work with an architect is that you're not an architect and you probably don't want to be an architect. You want to play architect sometimes. I have clients that uh, definitely want to play architect. Um, but you're not one, and so how do we e explore that spectrum of design possibilities for your particular project, right? That's why people would come to me. That's why people would hire an architect. But even with that kind of metric, clients are going to come to me and say, okay, I want you to design a house. We want, um, in this case here, let's say a 3,200, 3,000 to 3,400 square foot house. Okay. Where do we go from there, right? Because that spectrum of metrics is about a thousand miles wide. How do we narrow that goalpost? How do we get it down? But I always start every project with the same approach and I call it, you know, client homework. It's pretty simple, somewhat self-explanatory. I send them out an email. The email has a series of questions and tasks that the homeowners have to perform. Now, I also tell the homeowners, um, you know, whatever the client team is, that they don't share that information until each of them has finished and completed their homework and sent it to me. But the reality is, is that by separating them, I always find it very interesting that Occasionally, clients have some common goals, but occasionally, and probably more times than not, they have some very specific different goals. For example, I did a project where having a bathtub in the master bath 
and having kind of a nice serene environment for that to relax was how the husband wanted to come home. He said, I come home every night. I want to take a bath. I want to relax. That's kind of my time to myself. Okay. I've had people that focused on, hey, I want a really cool media room in the basement or I want a cool garage. I work on cars and we're going to put a car lift in the garage and and such. Or the wife might want just a really cool kitchen or she focuses on the master bathroom or the outdoor um, relationship of the house to that property if there's some significant uh, aspect of the site. But the reality is, is that all projects are different is my point. And to sit there and just say, okay, let's just start designing a house. I, as an architect, would be pretty naive to just kind of put down on paper what it is I think we should do. So I give homeowners, you know, this homework. And the homework is, is very simple. First question is, what does a successful home mean to you? Now, what do I mean by that? What I don't want to get, and I explain all this to the clients, um, and it's it's in this email that I send out. Um, you know, a successful home is not, don't come back at me with, oh, I want a 20 by 20 family room and I want our bedroom to be minimum 15 by 15, et cetera. I don't want that. I want the emotional side and the, the kind of more, um, how can I say, spiritual side of, what it is that you're trying to achieve by building what you're calling your dream home, right? I want to understand things like in our family room, well, we throw parties all the time. Our house is Christmas party, Thanksgiving, Super Bowl parties. So we really need a, an open space where we can handle 30 guests, and, and have a party, but I still want the family room to be comfortable when my husband and I want to sit and watch a movie on Friday night, right? I have some clients that say, we're not even going to put a TV in the family room. We just want a really nice, comfortable room where the family can gather, play some games, um, hang out together, and the TV isn't the focus of that room. So there's a, a kind of a wide spectrum, as you can see, that in just family room design. There's the couple that wants the, you know, 70, 80 inch plus TV on the wall. And then there's the couple that doesn't even want a TV on the wall. Those are two different spaces to design for. The site plays a major role. I always go out and visit the sites, walk the sites with the homeowner and kind of extract what they feel is important about the site, right? So yeah, we bought the site and we love this site. Well, why do you love it, right? What's what's driving that love? What bought, what drove the decision to make the purchase of that particular site? All of these things need to get wrapped up into that. What is going to make this a successful home, right? What what at the end of the the two year process or uh, and such is going to get you to sit back in that house and sit back and say yeah, this is way better than what I expected. This is exactly where I wanted to be. I love my house. So how do we get there? So what is a successful home? I also ask clients to just write a quick program of the spaces, right? Oh, we want a family room and kitchen. Obviously, there's a litany of spaces that are very common in all houses. But in addition to that program of rooms, what makes those successful, right? So we we'll use the kitchen, for example. I've had clients that were what I would term near chef type clients. They want a beautiful kitchen, beautiful appliances. They cook together. They wanted separate sinks, um, you know, separate work areas, but being able to, uh, you know, chat and discuss things while they're working on it, all of that was important. I've also had clients that say, Steve, you know, anything aside from heating up pizza in the microwave, that's about the extent of our cooking, right? So they order in, they do whatever they do. But the reality is, is those are two different kitchens. In the design process, all of these thoughts migrate. But the homework's job is to take that thousand mile wide goalpost and get it down to, you know, eight or 10 miles wide. We're just trying to narrow it down. I also ask clients to 
um, each of them to supply a series of photos, a series of exterior photos, and a series of an interior photos. Could be five photos, could be 10 photos. In those photos, it's really important that not only do they submit the photos, but it's very important to write a caption about what it is that you like about that photo. Like, I could show you a picture of the outside of the house, and I can say, okay, that's really nice. I like those roof lines, and the client says, well, yeah, it wasn't really, I didn't pick it for the roof lines. I really like the window arrangements that were in that photo. Or from the interior, it's, you know, they send me a picture of the kitchen, and I say, okay, that's a really nice kitchen. And the wife says, no, I sent you that photo because I really like the floors in that kitchen. Okay, well, that's why we write the captions, because I'm trying to, again, understand what it is that you like and what it is that you don't like. And I'm not necessarily looking for, hey, this is the stairway that we love, and then we just simply copy it. Um, it's more so that we're just, again, trying to narrow that goalpost down to a workable size, a size where I have some direction to understand what, you know, what kind of design does this thing want to be? You now people say, oh, I want a modern house. Okay. There's a, a lot of kind of different modern houses out there that uh, you can design for, you know, glass box to, you know, kind of something a, l a little bit more um, country modern as opposed to something that's, say, on the beach of the coast of Florida or California. Um, you know, there's there's different houses. There's, you know, the Colorado Mountain Modern, you know, these nice big glass boxes, big heavy roofs. Um, there's, there's a lot of these options. So that homework, again, it's narrowing down that process. So they send me the homework. What is a successful home? And they pretty much outlined, you know, how they like to do things on a day-to-day -day basis. What do they work through? What are things that are important to them about the process? And you can see it's uh, it's got some uh, meat to it here, but it's not overly extensive in what they've written. The interior and exterior um, photos that capture the, uh, the uh, captions so they had some photos and then underneath here, they I like the stonework on the facade. I like the rough texture. I like the dark trim. So these are all things that we can return to. I mean, we're not gonna get into coming at them the first meeting with what this thing looks like on the outside and picking out the color or trim or um, you know, what material the kitchen cabinets are made out of. So the homework is always kind of something that we're regurgitating in the design process to go through. This is the uh, program for all their rooms that, that they thought would be important to have inside their house. Now, some sometimes we take this list, we merge a couple rooms together to satisfy their needs because maybe we can do that. Sometimes maybe we can't, maybe we need to add a room or two. It's important to kind of at least get what their initial thoughts are. Um, and then we have what I call the list of needs, wants, and desires. And this is a pretty interesting list because the way I explain it to clients is that, you know, needs are the category of what you want in the project that it's not worth doing the project if we don't get those, right? So the needs are something that are somewhat definite part of the project. Wants, wants are things that are hey, if this works out in such a way that this can be included in the project, that would be really great. And then what we term desires. And the desires are, yeah, if we can fit this in, it would be really cool if we can do this or really cool if we can do that. And so knitting those together, but having an, an understanding as the architect that not only do they want these spaces and they want these spaces to perform in this manner that the homeowner can quantify the value that they place on each of these spaces and what they want. And value is really important. I mean, almost every client hears me use that word all the time in meetings that the design process, for me anyways, is really trying to understand um, what my clients value. 
And, and it's different for everybody. And the reality is, is sometimes you're not going to get everything you want, right? So whether it's a need, want, desire, and I'll give you an example. Um, I do a bunch of, you know, coastal properties. People say, well, I want a view of the ocean. I want to be able to see the fireplace and I want to see my 80 inch TV. Well, in a family room that might, even if you had 20 feet of wall, those three things that you want to see, well, that's a lot. So the question is, which one of those do you value more? Do we even put the TV on that wall or do we put it on a side wall? Do we put the fireplace um, in a different part of the room and maybe not there? Or do we try and capture the fireplace in the ocean view in the same view from the couch in the living room or from the dining room, kitchen, where whatever it is? But trying to get that understanding of which of those do they value, which one of them do they value more, and is any part of their value system subject to, yeah, that's really not as important to us as this is. And so that's what we're trying to strive for. And then I take that information and knit it together. And the, the better understanding that I can extract from them of their needs, wants, and desires and how they value that stuff, the easier it actually makes my job because then I can prioritize things in the design and put the most important room in the most important part of that site with the most important views to provide them, you know, a space that has that level of value that they're in search of there. So, and a lot of clients, um, you know, feedback has been on the homework that, you know, this was a great exercise that we never even really thought about our house this way. And, and it's, not so much that they're not intelligent people. It's just they're not trained to think of a house that way. They go to their sister's house. Their sister has a 20 by 20 family room. And they come back at me and says, hey, my sister has a 20 by 20 family room. I think it's a little too small. I think ours wants to be 20 by 24. And while that may seem like it works as a you know dimensional metric, but the reality is, is if the house isn't designed with the same window layout, TV layout, et cetera, et cetera, then you could potentially have a family room that is 16 by 18 that performs better than the sister's 20 by 20 family room. So, you know, there's this um, kind of uh, matrix as the architect that I have to develop that is where their value system lies, and then how does that work um, with my experience of space planning and, you know, laying out the elevations and, and how all of this works. You know, one of, one of the other favorites of mine is I get clients that, you know, they'll draw up their floor plans and send it to me, and I say, yeah, that's that might look like a great floor plan to you. It might even work in your mind, but how do you put a roof on that? And the minute you ask that question, then they sit there and step back and say, hmm, yeah, I never really even thought about that. Exactly. So it's all, again, ties back to that awareness. What are the right questions to ask? Um, what are the right answers? Making people aware of that while you're designing the floor plan, at some point this has to become a 3D reality, and we actually have to build it. So some of those things are going to work out. Some of them aren't going to work out. But the homework helps us get there so it's always a great start you know the needs wants and desires sets us up for a mutual understanding of what makes this a successful um you know start to the project so i take that homework i go and review it in reviewing the homework i inevitably come up with a whole series of questions more of clarification and or using my experience to say, okay, you said that we like to do this. And I say, does that mean this or does it mean that? And so we have that discussion and get even a little bit more clarity. So after we have that homework review meeting, then I set off and I start designing the project and come up with some ideas and we move in into what's termed the schematic design phase which is basically putting a bunch of ideas down on paper and start talking about how do we take those needs, wants, and desires and make them build space. So 
That's the homework. 